Hello and welcome to this webinar titled Integration of Disposable Components into Traditional Stainless Steel Facilities, hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine and presented by Miriam Monch, Director of Marketing of Sartorius Stedim Biotech Integrated Solutions, and Ron Bates, who leads the Manufacturing Science and Technology Group at Bristol Myers Squibb. My name is Oshoya Balog, and I will be the moderator. Before we begin, I would just like to remind our viewers that there will be a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Audience members can send their questions at any time during the presentation via the questions tab located at the right-hand side of your screen, and we will go through these at the end of the webinar. Now, please allow me to introduce our speakers. First, let me introduce you to Miriam Monge, who is the Director of Marketing at Sartorius Stedim Biotech Integrated Solutions. Miriam is best known in the industry for her contribution during the pioneering phase of single-use disposable technologies as the Marketing Director for Stedim Biosystems. Miriam also founded and chaired the ISP Global Disposables Community of Practice in 2008, which is aimed at both promoting education and evaluating the global regulatory requirements for single-use disposable technologies. For several years, Miriam has co-authored Disposable Advisor, which is a regular column in Biofarm International magazine. She is also a senior visiting lecturer at University College London Department of Biochemical Engineering and an editorial advisor for Bioprocess International. Miriam's current position at Sartorius Stedim Biotech focuses on building a global process development team combined with developing a full bioprocess platform offerings based on disposable and hybrid technologies for monoclonal antibodies, viral vectors, vaccines, antibody conjugates, intensified continuous processing with related services from product design to CGMP commercial scale. Prior to joining Sartorius, Miriam spent six years as a principal consultant at Biofarm Services, where her focus was on how processes can be optimized in early phase development through bioprocess modeling of technology and process design options, enabling highest throughput and lowest cost of goods. During this time, Miriam also acted as a subject matter expert and internal consultant on single-use strategy and implementation for major biopharmas such as Sanofi and contract manufacturers such as Beringer Ingelheim and CMC Biologics. Now, please allow me to introduce our second speaker, Ron Bates, who leads the Manufacturing Science and Technology Group at Bristol Myers Squibb. Ron leads the Manufacturing Science and Technology Group at Bristol Myers Squibb in Syracuse, New York, and is responsible for monitoring, validating, transferring, and improving late stage and commercial manufacturing processes. Prior to Bristol Myers Squibb, Ron led the process development and MST group at Allergen focusing on developing, optimizing, characterizing, transferring, and support manufacturing of wild type and recombinant prokaryotic based system to manufacturing. At Allergen, they developed high throughput methods and implemented disposable processing. Prior to Allergen, Ron worked at Bristol Myers Squibb, Syracuse, developing and transferring downstream processes to manufacturing for late stage FC fusion and monoclonal antibodies. Before Bristol Myers Squibb, Dr. Bates worked at Pfizer, purifying small molecule moieties using chiral, normal phase and reversed phase chromatography in traditional flash and multi-column continuous systems. Ron received his PhD from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in biochemical engineering under dark free studying mathematical modeling of ion exchange chromatography and the Bachelor of Science in chemical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Now, let me hand it over to Miriam to start the webinar. Welcome, Miriam. 
Thank you very much indeed. And yes, welcome to all our audience on the on the webinar today. And uh, thank you to Ron for inviting me to give this joint uh, uh, presentation on integration of disposables into stainless steel facilities. So. By way of an agenda today, I'd like to touch on where is the industry heading. We're going to talk about uh, integration of hybrid systems and take some uh, end user case studies then. First of all, a fermentation expansion project. And then secondly, a buffer storage and distribution project. We'll then come on to talk about uh, engineering requirements for hybrid systems. And then I'll hand on to Ron uh, for his case study and an end user insight uh, through his experience at Bristol Myers Squibb. So first of all, uh, just a word about where is the industry heading. And uh, Sartorius uh, Stenham, we're very active members of the BPOG, the Bioforum Operations Group. Uh, we, we use this very much to help us in defining our strategy. And this is an association bringing together industry leading experts from major biopharmaceutical companies working together to define the industry roadmap for the future based on identified industry needs. And uh, the, the BPOC have really identified four major market trends that are likely to lead to major changes uh, in the market. So I'd just like to touch uh, on these. Uh, first one being uh, cost pressure. So, of course, due to the high cost of biologics treatments, there's increasing cost pressure to make biologics more affordable and open up access to a greater percentage of the world's population. So uh, the arrival of biosimilars adds to that pressure and the ability to reduce cost of goods of the drug, which includes uh, both a reduction in capital and operating costs, is a key focus. Secondly, the, another major concern to the market is that of an uncertainty, and, and there's a strong attrition rate in the biopharmaceutical pipeline. So only 10% of those biologic drugs in the pipeline actually make it to market. In addition, accurate forecasts for biologic demands have often been uh, very difficult uh, to, to achieve. And in the past, uh, a stainless steel uh, facility could take uh, several years to build and commission, and in addition, there'd be no guarantee that that facility would actually be used to manufacture the drugs for which it was originally designed. So that's uh, been inherently quite a, a big issue. Another one is what is that of uh, market growth. That's a key uh, important factor. So with the lowering of the barrier to entry for in-country manufacture, uh, particularly as a result of uh, implementation of single-use technologies, we're seeing a strong demand for in-country manufacture, notably from emerging markets. Uh, new product classes is also something that's very much coming to the fore, including bispecific and tri-specific MABs, ADC, cell, and gene therapy. So these are all uh, leading to new requirements uh, in the biomanufacturing industry. And so I think a very important point to note is that the BPOG really emphasize that a tenfold improvement in manufacturing robustness and reliability is needed in order to improve product quality and to reduce the waste associated with failed batches. So many, many challenges ahead for the biologics industry. And just another point I'd like to mention, we talked about cost as a very important factor. And you can see here uh, three uh, scenarios or four scenarios actually developed uh, by uh, the BPOG, and you, so you can see at the top level, uh, the, the, you can see on the bottom then the final production rate in terms of kilograms per year. On the left-hand side, you can see net present cost. Uh, so you can see where uh, the costs are lie with the traditional stainless steel batch. If we're looking at a six-pack, 15k stainless steel facility, or indeed a 12, uh, a 12, uh, a six-pack, 12,000 liter scale. Uh, facility, and you can see then, of course, that stainless steel comes into its own mostly as you get to the larger production volumes. You can see then where single use is currently positioned, uh, in turn, where you can see the six times 2,000 liter single use fed batch, and that has been really up and to date where single use comes into its own. So, certainly for when you're manufacturing smaller production volumes single use has a key card to play in terms of being able to reduce costs. Of course, of course, as the production volumes increase, then the relative benefit in terms of economics of working with single use uh, does 
tailor, really sort of tail off. So typically you could consider that six times 2,000 litre is ideal for manufacturing 500 kicks of product per year uh, versus 2,500 kicks per year if you're talking about six times 10,000 litre scale. So this really limits the usefulness of single-use facilities in fed batch mode for commercial supply. So this is really where the hybrid positioning can have a key role to play as you move into those larger production volumes uh, in that sort of mid-phase MAB production, for example, where a hybrid, uh, a mix of stainless and single-use can come into its own. Of course, you can see with the other two scenarios, this is uh, another very hot topic in the industry that we're not going to be addressing on this webinar, but that of single use for intensified processing or for, for perfusion processes where, again, you can see the very, very compelling economics, even at the larger volumes, particularly as you're working towards intensified uh, uh, batch manufacturing. Uh, in fact, you're able to achieve a three-fold volumetric increase. And this has indeed already been demonstrated by certain examples of intensified facilities presented, for example, by Amgen in the uh, Singapore facility, by BI, Sanofi, and several others. So just to give you a positioning, really, of the process economic scenarios in the market today. So when we think about single-use versus traditional, uh, this, we're taking here an example of a of a small-scale single-use uh, facility. Uh, this is a facility design I presented at the BPSA end of 2016. Uh, it was a design I, I worked on myself as a consultant. And uh, the success of single-use is driven by multiple factors. Uh, but here, again, one of the key factors you can see here is that you are able when implementing end-to-end -end single use in, in this clinical manufacturing facility, so working with 1,000 liter scale uh, bioreactors, you're able to reduce the overall facility floor space um, in this scenario by 25%. You can reduce the volumes for classified areas by 26% uh, and, uh, and the resulting reduction of air supply for classified areas. And this is achieved uh, notably by uh, designing the facility in such a way that the support solutions such as medium buffers are left in a central CNC uh, corridor and then those large volume solutions are fed through the wall into the higher classification clean rooms where the actual manufacturing takes place. And again, you have more details here. This was uh, uh, at the time I gave this presentation, there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm uh, at the BPSA because they could really see how you can demonstrate that single use has a key role to play in being able to implement a more sustainable facility because as you eliminate the needs for cleaning and steaming of stainless steel vessels, you can substantially reduce the water requirements uh, by, an, by typically on average about 70% water requirement reduction. Uh, again, that will depend on the scale and type of process and the level of integration of uh, single use. Uh, systems, and of course that applies also then to, to hybrid approaches. So we are seeing this paradigm shift uh, towards uh, single use for the reasons I have just uh, mentioned to you, uh, and uh, however there are still a number of limitations and drawbacks, so certainly if we're working in MAB fed batch mode, uh, the connectors, maximum tube diameter is one inch internal diameter. You have a maximum bag container size of 3,000 liter scale, although I heard recently that there is a supplier who's launched a, a 4,000 liter scale system. You have limited mixing performance for, for mixing and, and available sensors. There's still work to be done in that area. And of course, there's always the challenge of movement of large bags through the, through the facility. So these are some of the subjects that we will be looking at uh, in our uh, webinar uh, today. So if we think about hybrid systems linking stainless steel with single use, what, what, what changes? So you can see on the left-hand side, typically in stainless steel, you're working with hard pipe systems that are with transfers through overpressure. And in the case of single use, then you're working uh, using connections with flexible tubing and transfers by peristaltic pumps. 
so uh, really when we're looking at hybrids, as we go back to those economics at the beginning, uh, we're going to be thinking then about where did it make best sense to implement single use into that given process and, and you know, what is the reasoning, what are the objectives of implementing more single use into an existing stainless steel process. It may be in the case of CMOs, for example, it may be that need for more inherent flexibility. And of course, consistent interfaces between stainless steel and plastics play a very important role. So one of the keys, of course, is the interface of stainless steel to single use. And here you can see an example of the steam through uh, connector. This is a gamma sterilized connector on the sterile bag assembly. And there will be, therefore, a connection to the stainless steel valve addition port through tri-clamps. Uh, there'll be a SIP, uh, so steam in place of additional port after hookup of the steam through connector. In this, in this uh, case, the maximum tube size, size is an internal diameter of half an inch. If we come on then to uh, an alternative, we have the autoclaved valve and tube uh, welding, as you can see here, working then with sealed thermoplastic tubing, uh, sterilizing the autoclave and steam in place of the additional port after hookup of the autoclave valve. And you can connect tubes from the sterile bag assembly and autoclave valve through tube welding. In this case, the maximum tube size is 3 quarters of an inch internal diameter. So we come on now to our first uh, case study. And uh, this is a case study then based on uh, a fermentation expansion project. So you can see here the client's uh, existing uh, process in the stainless steel version and then where he was wanting to um, expand uh, this, uh, this project through implementation of additional single use. And we're going to take a closer look now uh, at uh, that in terms of the overall uh, capability. So um, you can see you have the seed fermentation train with single-use bioreactors at 50 litre and 500 litre wave systems. Uh, in this scenario, then, we were keeping all the additional vessels that needed in-situ sterilization of media. And uh, we would keep all the media vessels that were over 500 litre scale as stainless steel. We would, however, replace all the additional vessels with sterile filtration of media through mobile bag containers. And we would get rid of mobile vessels for transportation from media preparation uh, to the process uh, area in this uh, scenario. So the aim of this case study was really just to show uh, the relative immediate cost impacts of making those changes. And uh, our engineering group made the following calculations in terms of the uh, savings that could be implemented uh, by the changes I've just uh, indicated in terms of implementing single use for the bioreactor seed train and uh, changing out some of the smaller scale uh, stainless steel media and buffer prep for mobile vessels. You were already able to reduce instrumentation and control requirements, uh, engineering qualification and overall transportation uh, making an overall saving in this uh, uh, expansion project of 21%. Uh, Going to come on now to uh, what I would call a more detailed uh, analysis of uh, of implementation uh, of uh, hybrid systems uh, into uh, downstream processing, <coughs> and uh, this will involve then. Um, looking in more detail into buffer, into buffer systems. And I expect that the majority of the people on the call today are well aware of uh, the requirements in up, up and downstream processing for biomanufacturing. Uh, and so in the case of the downstream process, you have product harvest and purification to the required quality. You have multiple chromatography steps for purification of the target protein. Uh, sanitary systems, which are going to be open systems, the main equipment are chromatography skids and columns and um, buffer preparation storage as supporting process.
So you can see here the buffer flow diagram for the MAB uh, downstream uh, process. So uh, in most cases, current production strategies for manufacturing of protein therapeutics are based on platform processes that need to allow easy adaptation for multiple products in CMO facilities. So this case study was for a specific uh, CDMO. And if different product titers in upstream can be handled with the available buffer volumes in downstream, it's extremely important. So as a consequence of flexibility, the downstream process has to be designed for the expected tighter range in the upstream process, such as a cell culture titer of three to five grams per liter. Then the diagram you can see here, this shows the downstream unit operations for the process steps of uh, the typical MAB platform uh, at this given client. So you have the protein A affinity chromatography, two additional chromo steps typically used for purification. You have a cation exchange chromo for removal of aggregates and an anion exchange chromo for removal of DNA. The viral clearance, you have uh, low pH virus and activation step after the protein A. You have virus filtration after anion exchange, and you have additional dead end filtration for removal of impurities and ultrafiltration, diafiltration uh, steps. So, in terms of the buffer demands then for this MAB downstream process, uh, you can see in this table, so each individual purification as I've just, uh, step as I've just described requires a number of specific buffers with different volumes. And these buffers are normally prepared in buffer preparation vessels or buffer mixing bags, and they're then transferred to intermediate storage into buffer storage vessels or buffer storage bags, and finally distributed to the point of use for the required process step. So you can see in this table the volumes of different buffers that are required for uh, this MAB purification process. So I would say that the logistics uh, for preparation, storage, and distribution are uh, often uh, underestimated. Uh, so here you can see data on the required buffer volumes for a typical 2,000 liter MAB downstream process with a product titer of five grams per liter. So as our engineering teams at Sartorius worked on the overall concept for buffer storage and distribution, we're really trying to think about how can we keep it simple and safe, and of course, very important that we're not taking up too much space uh, in the facility with large buffer tank farms, trying to think about keeping the valve traffic stations for routing as straightforward as possible, and really trying to avoid what I call a spaghetti factory for you know flexible tubing running across the floor. Certainly in the early days, this was always a real challenge in single-use facilities that typically go into often there was messy tubing uh, lying around the floor. And this is really something that needs to be well thought through as to the routing of tubing uh, in, in these single-use facilities. Very important. And particularly when you're implementing then single-use into existing stainless steel, this can be a uh, facility that can be a real challenge. Uh, so that needs to be given careful thought. You also need then to think about the location of the buffer hole vessels and bags, um, both in terms of the buffer hold area, the process area. You need to think about uniform methods to energy connections from the buffer distribution system. Again, trying to think about maximum overall flexibility, extremely, extremely important. So as you can see, as, as you saw in the earlier table, the, pur the purification of those 2,000 liter uh, systems. And um, uh, you have then uh, the purification of cell broth yielding less than 200 liters of final ultra substance requires a number of different buffers with a total volume of more than 25,000 liters. So the individual volumes are between 50 liters and 2,000 liters. So the buffer volumes for each process step have been evaluated in this case, by modeling, uh, process modeling using mass balance calculations at different product titers. So in the second step, buffer usage diagrams, as you can see here, were prepared by our teams for each process step. So here you can see the example of a buffer usage diagram for the protein A chromatography step. The buffer usage diagram has helped to further optimize the concepts and designs for buffer storage and buffer distribution, such as number of required buffers, volumes of each buffer, the buffer storage system, the location of the buffer storage systems, and so on. 
So I'd say the benefits of working with single use as compared to stainless steel buffer systems is a high degree of flexibility. So the bag size can be easily changed if a new process requires this. Uh, the further advantages, of course, are much less requirement for clean and steam in place, as I was talking about, less requirements for water earlier on. And small size bags can be directly carried to the point of use without the need for transfer systems. So in terms of utilization of single use bags for buffer storage, however, there are some technical limitations I was mentioning earlier. So currently the maximum size of 3D bags from Sartorius is 3,000 liters, and the flexible hoses that can come with the bags are limited to one inch ID, which results in a maximum flow of about 1.8 cubic meters per hour. So there are also some practical considerations. So 2D bags should be limited in size so that they can be transported whilst filled using additional trays or trolleys suitable maximum size is, is 20 liters. And 3D bags in bag containers which are located in higher classification process rooms should be limited in size so that they can be moved by trolleys in filled state without using forklifts. So obviously you don't want to be using those forklifts in those, uh, in those higher classification areas. So those forklifts are recommended for bags larger than 500 liter scale. And so the recommendation there would be that the large bags in the buffer prep area should be installed in stationary bag containers with easy connection of flexible holders to headers for filling and buffer distribution. So yeah, there's a, I'd say there's a lot to think about <laughs> as we think about uh, implementation of single use into uh, existing stainless steel facilities. And you can see here some of the selection criteria. Uh, you can see in terms of 2D bags are used only up to 20 liters, 3D bags that need to be moved are used only up to 200 liters, as I was saying earlier. And uh, you can see in this table the type of bags related to the buffer volume and the location where the bag will be filled with the buffer and the method for distribution. So I'd say clear bag selection criteria helps to minimize the number of different bag types and to standardize on the connection method. So this is uh, maybe a little bit, bit more detail than we have time for today. I'm conscious that time is ticking and I need to let Ron uh, uh, speak. So I'm just going to skip on this. This is just ex explaining how we handled uh, some of the facts that midway in the project uh, there, was, there was a requirement identified for additional capacity and how we actually handled uh, that point. And uh, we have then uh, overall, we're looking at buffer distribution piping, and in this case, the buffer transfer from the buffer prep room to the process room is done by gravity flow, which is a well-established method for stainless steel systems, of course, because it doesn't require pumps or pressurized vessels. Uh, the advantage of the gravity flow have been adapted to buffer transfer out of bags within this project. So here you can see a simplified P&I diagram for the routing of the buffer transfer lines from the buffer preparation room via a mezzanine floor above the process rooms to the three process rooms at the ground floor. So in this case, only a few automotive valves are needed to flow past selection for each of the eight buffer transfer lines. Uh, so again, in the interest of time, uh, I would just add here that uh, through this project, we were able to establish a clear concept for the utilization of buffer storage bags, which resulted in freed up process clean rooms we were able to install buffer capacity in conjunction with simple and flexible buffer distribution concepts, um, which, is, which provides the necessary flexibility for running different low and high tighter processes in a CMO facility. So the single-use systems that you've seen in this uh, case study uh, have been fully integrated into plant-wide automation systems with special functionality added for guiding and tracking of manual operations. So uh, I was just going to touch very briefly on engineering requirements uh, for hybrid systems. So uh, at Sartorius, we, we have a concept uh, design service, as you've seen on some of the uh, case studies I've rapidly shown uh, here. I would say our core focus as a, as a supplier is to focus on uh, the, process, the process design. Uh, so obviously the conceptual design, trying to think about optimized facility design based on single use. And then, well, of course, we will work uh, hand in hand with the engineering contractor and local design institute that you, the end users, select. Uh, obviously bringing our single use expertise to the table in that uh, scenario. Another aspect that we have developed 
uh, is very much that of um, extended process flow diagrams, uh, then integrating single-use and multi-use equipment, which can be used as a guide through conceptual design, basic design, and uh, detailed design. And you can see some excerpts uh, here. So just, um, and also, again, I mentioned the need to really think about optimized layout, thinking about, as you saw in that Pierre Faber example earlier, how can I really optimize my facility design so that I can reduce my footprint, that I can reduce the number of higher classification clean rooms, thinking about uh, utility requirements, often utilities for, uh, uh, you know, for single-use facilities are over-specified, of course, in the case that you're implementing single use into an existing stainless steel facility, uh, you're likely to require less water. Uh, I guess you're not going to retrofit your utility systems, but you will require typically less water in that, in that case. And you can see here then an example of that uh, design I was talking about earlier where you will leave the higher um, volume medium buffer prep uh, systems uh, and storage systems in the CNC corridor that you can see on the left of this diagram and feed through the wall into the higher classification clean room areas. Very important to think about uh, equipment movement through the facility, uh, thinking about also waste flows, because again, that will be very different from a traditional uh, stainless steel uh, situation. So in summary, I apologize, I've rushed a little bit through that, but I do want to leave some time for my colleagues. So um, obviously, uh, by implementing more single use, you're providing a, high a higher degree of flexibility, particularly in multi-product CMO uh, scenarios. Um, uh, at Sartorius, we always work with our clients to try and think through what makes the best sense for their process, whether it is all enter and single use, whether it is a hybrid system, according, again, to the uh, what, which scenario is going to give them the highest throughput and lowest cost of goods. And as you move into those higher volume scenarios, as you saw in the BPOC scenarios, that may well be this, this mix of stainless steel and single use. Um, single use systems do need other automation functionalities like operator guidance, material tracking, and equipment tracking. Um, so the overall required volume for buffer storage and complexity for buffer distribution, as I uh, tried to rapidly demonstrate in the case study, should not be underestimated. Um, and um, we need to think very carefully about the design to try and keep it as simple as possible uh, whilst providing a high level uh, of flexibility. And um, our engineers are very attentive for the need uh, to obviously uh, uh, apply good engineering practice in all project phases, and uh, the documents for multi-use and single-use uh, in hybrid systems need to be consistent. And we do find, as I mentioned, then these extended process flow diagrams, a very good process design tool in all engineering phases. And with that, I will hand over to uh, my, co my colleague, Ron, for the next part of the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Miriam. I would just like to remind our viewers again that there will be a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Audience members can send their questions at any time during the presentation via the questions tab located at the right-hand side of your screen, and we will go through these at the end of the webinar. Now let me hand it over to Ron to start the webinar. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, and, and welcome to everyone on the phone uh, in all the different time zones. Uh, as well as um, I'd like to thank uh, BioPharm Asia for hosting this, um, and uh, Miriam for doing a fantastic job of uh, doing my work for me and explaining uh, everything that that I was planning on um, going through in painstaking detail. Oh dear, detail. don't say that, Ron. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that makes my job very easy. And um, uh, but no, in all in all seriousness. Um, I do want to thank Miriam for setting the table and providing some great examples of what's available uh, from the suppliers. And what I want to do over the next um, 15 to 20 minutes or so is really work through some of the things that we've run into uh, in, at Bristol, as well as uh, some of the things I've heard just at different conferences and, and different backroom conversations, and, and really look at what happens to some of these aging stainless steel facilities as the world moves more towards uh, disposables. Are there places in 
the aging stainless steel seal facilities to integrate disposables into them, and how would you do that, and what are the advantages? When is a good time to do that in, in situations like that? So that's what I want to kind of walk you through. Um, as I mentioned, there are a few introduction slides, which I will go through fairly quickly. Um, uh, here's an outline of what I'm, what I'm going to talk about um, over the next you know, 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, spending a little bit of time really looking at the facility considerations, because I think those are the questions that really we have to ask as engineers. You know, why do we want to do it? Does it matter what the size of my equipment is, or should I go all stainless, continue to stay all stainless? Should I integrate? Should I just tear it down and build new and start fully disposable? Uh, th those are some of the questions that I know plague the industry, uh, as well as some of our finance guys. Uh, who are trying to uh, rein us in from our uh, spending sprees. So just you know, to, to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, over the rest of this talk, uh, single use is in disposables are really the same thing. I'm defining single use as a product that is not reused. I do understand, based on your economics, anything can be single use, although I, I would question the people who throw away 100 centimeter protein A columns after one use. But, but again, that's, that's for their economics, not for ours. Um, and another topic that I want to kind of hint at is the differentiation between a strict single-use system and then something that may be limited use. And how can we go back and forth between the two to, to really gather the benefits of single-use but not destroy our economies? And, and we'll talk about that a little bit in this presentation as well. Uh, so, so as I see it, there are some limitations. Um, however, those limitations uh, from suppliers like Miriam and Sartorius are getting better, uh, or that we're avoiding some of those limitations uh, more and more as we go through this. Um, we do widely use single use in, in everyday work. Uh, bioreactors, they're becoming the norm, especially when we're talking about small scale and in, in that, to, to Miriam's point, it was up to around three to 4,000 liter, uh, depending on, on which uh, vendor you choose. Connections, tubes, pipes, you know, th these, these things are more and more becoming disposable. They're just easier to use. Uh, solutions and product containers, especially for the smaller sizes. And, you know, filters for 0.2 micron vent filters are almost all single use. Um, some things that are less commonly used are prepacked chromatography columns, TFF membranes, uh, but there are certain companies out there that are doing a really good job of packing chromatography columns that are used in a single-use format. And uh, single-use TFF membranes are gaining more and more, especially single-pass single-use TFF membranes, are getting really interesting. And there are definitely uh, niche areas that are, are already obvious, uh, small volume products, pilot plants, uh, small volume CMOs in the labs and molecules that have toxicity issues really are, are almost ideally suited for disposables. And there are entire processes being run today using single use uh, components. Uh, there is the caveat that uh, most people do reuse their chromatography columns or they do, you know, that limited use I described earlier. <coughs> um, but it's not all roses. There are some limitations that we have to uh, really mention and uh, accommodate. Most single-use systems are single source. When you start working through the leachables and extractables and you file your, your different processes with the different health authorities, you almost always end up in a situation where your, your components are single-use. So we do have to figure out a way around this. And because they're single sourced, most of the components are special order and they do take a, a long lead time to get. They're not off the shelf, therefore the, the manufacturers and the suppliers don't have a bunch of them sitting around waiting for your order. There is a, a number of groups working on solutions to this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but do realize that before you dive head first into this area, you do need to consider your supply chain. Okay, so just kind of looking at that, there, there is some interesting uh, rationales and, and um, processes and, and mental thoughts that have to go into 
you know, do you go for disposables or do you go stay with fixed equipment? Uh, typically, if I'm talking about an existing facility, there are no supply chain negative ad adverse offend, uh, effects um, because you've already got your system in place. When I switch to disposables, it does complicate matters, uh, especially around the fact that if you're doing a lot of runs, if you have a, a, a short cadence, you're going to need new, new warehouse space, and it may be a great deal more. So you do have to factor that in. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, some of the single source natures of disposables become uh, very problematic. Um, there are some benefits, and that's something that you know we wouldn't do a single use or we wouldn't do any deviation from where we currently are if there wasn't the benefits. Um, there are you know the the pre sterilized nature of disposables make it almost um, make um, sterilization almost a thing of the past. Uh, no product carryover is a great thing, especially as you're going to a multi-use facility that has to really worry about not only product carryover from lot to lot, but from product to product. Um, they do require more studies. You have to make sure that you're not adding something negative that may hurt the patients into your product, and therefore you're going to need extractables and leachable studies. Uh, a lot of this you can also handle using uh, risk assessments. You know, for example, if you're worried about a, product, uh, a, a harmful component leaching into, you know, a bioreactor, look at your downstream clearance. You may be able to, to minimize the amount of uh, leachable studies you have to do. And I think one of the biggest benefits of switching your, or partly switching your existing facility over to disposables comes in the order of risk of contamination. Uh, you know, old facilities have a ton of negative aspects to them. Over the years, they've been built and rebuilt and modified, and there are new dead legs and low mixing areas. Perhaps the slant's not right on some of your piping. All this can harbor microbial growth. When you're looking at something that you install, run, and throw away like a disposable, your risk of contamination goes very, very low. Um, uh, the other positive thing is if you're uh, CIP and cleaning in place and sterilizing in place, you use a lot of water. Um, Wi-Fi is expensive, so if you don't have to do that, you save time and money. Uh, not only, not only that, there is a safety concern around using, you know, hot caustic or hot Wi-Fi to clean and sterilize your systems. All these are very positive benefits uh, from switching at least some of your facility over to disposables. And um, however, the, the, the negatives are, are still there. You do want to be sure to have a system where your bags aren't going to get punctured because, you know, it's really hard to puncture a stainless steel tank. It's less hard to do so in a plastic bag. Um, I'm not going to get into the caustics. Miriam, the cost of this, sorry, not caustic, cost. Uh, Miriam mentioned this quite a bit in her talk. Uh, plus, I, I do believe it's almost a case-by-case -case basis depending on if you're in a high water cost, low water cost, low disposable cost area, or high disposable cost area. So, you know, th there are some items here I do want to just kind of touch upon. And to the audience, I will say, you know, think about it and talk to your, uh, your finance group to see what, what benefits you the most. Um, fixed equipment depreciates, and it also costs a lot to, to, um, to install it to begin with. Disposables will cost more each batch. Wi-Fi cost could be higher for fixed equipment. Storage cost higher with disposables, um, as well as getting rid of all that plastic could be higher with disposables. Uh, whether or not the overall facility cost, the employee cost is, you know, higher or lower with one or the two systems, again, that's really up to your own finances. Uh, but it is worth doing the math to try and figure out what would be the best alternative. Um, and as you're deciding what to switch over, you know, the recommendations I have is to do that risk benefit analysis. You know, how many contaminations does your facility get per year? How complicated is your current supply chain? You know, again, use your own costing model, but what is the cost beneficial or differential, sorry? Um, when looking at new versus existing, how much, if you're looking at a stainless steel facility now, how much single use should be built into the new facility? Is this something that you know you you, you want to 
um, start off going in the right direction. And, and in my opinion, the benefit of disposables is in the eye of the beholder. Some people will look at it and say, I have to move that way. Others will come up with reasons why they, they want to stick to their fixed stainless steel systems. Um, and again, look, look toward your uh, risk assessments to help guide this. Uh, this slide is very complicated. Obviously, I'm not going to go through it in the time we have. But I did want to throw out a number of things to look at. In a fixed facility, contamination comes in many, many ways. Um, and here's just a few of them that I've encountered or heard about. You know, with your um, diaphragm, O-rings, and gaskets, um, dead legs in the systems, poor design due to spatial limitations, also, there are cold spots where your, your SIP may not hit. Um, the other problem, not necessarily a contamination risk, but it, you do need to validate uh, CIP, SIP, and as you change that system, you have to revalidate it. So that can take quite a while uh, in time and energy, as well as money. Um, and of course, aging facilities have more of the things I just talked about. Therefore, they're going to have more or a higher potential risk of contamination. Um, so, you know, again, to go back to the debate uh, specifically around CIP, SIP, what makes the most sense? Go into plastics where I get it pre-sterilized and dispose it, or do I actually build a system, you know, perhaps even specific skids that move around to different pieces of equipment, uh, tanks, transfer lines, transfer panels, chromatography columns, things like that, um, to do that, that cleaning and sterilizing. You have to evaluate a number of things. Energy becomes the most uh, obvious, you know, your water, your heat, your chemicals, and then what do I do with all the stuff I'm generating? Um, you know, there's a lot of water that goes through this, and it's usually tainted with either hydroxide or some sort of uh, cleaning solution. So you have to work on how you neutralize it and dispose of it. Um, there is a risk of contamination. Uh, CIP takes a, a whole shift usually to do, where you know disposables, really you can get the next batch ready to go in an hour or two. So you have to look at that timing as well. Uh, again, the cost of uh, stainless steel depreciates. Again, some of these aging facilities, very little depreciation left. So it's not really an important thing to consider. Uh, as far as the newer facilities, you're probably spending an awful lot of capital on depreciation. So it may be something you want to look at. Um, also realize that often when you change systems, you have to fully uh, depreciate it before you move on. So that's another thing you may want to look into. Um, however, it still may be cheaper to tear it out than to go ahead and, uh, and depreciate more. I do want to comment a little bit on the size. I think this is important to note. For smaller facilities, as I mentioned here, it may be easier to use disposables and, and you know, even build new or retrofit. But for some of our very larger facilities, 15,000, 25,000, there's not going to be a lot of opportunities for you to switch into a disposable type situation. Um, although the vendors are recognizing this and they are building bigger, stronger tubes and bags and things like that to help with that. Um, the other problem that some of the existing facilities have is space constraints. You know, you already have walls and footpor footprints that are probably maxed out. So when you go into adding a new technology, say ripping out a tank to put in a single-use mixer, uh, the footprints may not match up and that may have a ripple effect where you have to then modify where you put your chromatography skid or where your bioreactors are or you have to knock out walls, and then, then it starts getting into a bigger capital project. So that is something that you, know, you have to consider. Um, and I mentioned some of the opportunities here, disposable mixers, you know, bags for powder additions, uh, transfer lines that are single use, uh, bags versus bioreactors, and of course flasks versus the uh, uh, disposable flasks versus glass flasks. Um, when you're building your new facility, you should take that into account to make sure that you're not wasting time and resources building something that in five years you're going to want to change. So do the, do the risk assessment up front. And even if you decide to go stainless steel, make sure you, you build it in such a way that you can 
expand later if you decide to change your um, uh, change your mode of technology. Um, if we start looking at some of the smaller type facilities, like our pilot plants or our clinical facilities, and especially anything made in that 2K, 2,000 liter or smaller facility, you know, disposables really is going to be, I think, you know, you, you're, that's your comfort zone. I wouldn't even discuss building a new pilot plant with stainless steel. It doesn't really make financial sense. Again, do your own costing, but what I've looked at and talked about with other people, really if you're going to be doing a lot of projects, small volumes or small number of runs, that's ideally suited for disposables and it really should be something you, you look into. Um, if you're going into that 2,000 liter or smaller and, and really now the conversation is really looking at 3,000 liter or smaller, build your facilities using these disposable situation, um, upstream especially, disposable containers, um, seeds, bioreactors, even a lot of the harvest equipment really go into your single use. Uh, the chromatography columns, as I mentioned, are going to be difficult. And if you're working with monoclonal antibodies and you're thinking of doing a protein A capture step, uh, your finance guys probably aren't going to want you to throw away that every, every run. So look into the, the reusable chromatography, but, but maybe do it intelligently so you build uh, disposables into that to, to make your uh, SIP and CIP much easier. When you start moving up to the 5,000 liter, you have to really look into what makes sense. If I go to two to 3,000 liter bioreactors, can I do more runs to utilize that as opposed to building or using our 5,000 liter stainless steel? That's probably where your, your long-term forecasting is going to need to be accurate. And I know in the biologics game that is kind of an oxymoron. Long-term forecasting and, and accuracy don't really go hand in hand, but that's for a different discussion. Um, so 5,000 to me is where we start getting a, a real transition to what would make the most sense. Do I want to go stainless or do I want to stay, uh, or do I want to stay stainless or go disposable? There are many opportunities where stainless steel just makes sense. Um, and this is really where you're going to get into the, the volume size where you could go either way. Again, look at, look at the op opportunities and decide what makes the most sense for each individual uh, situation. And as I mentioned before, as you get up to 15 to 25,000, your opportunities are limited. Um, there are some, and you should consider them. Uh, however, for the most part, you're probably going to be looking at nice, shiny stainless steel facilities. So if I do a quick case study, you know, a 5,000 liter facility for a monoclonal with a 2 gram per liter cell culture, standard one meter columns. Um, we do have uh, limited single use components, fixed tanks, connections, things like that. Um, we do have dedicated media prep areas, media and buffer prep areas. Uh, we don't do a lot of concentrations. Uh, we do have portable tanks. And let's, for the sake of this, say we have unlimited utilities. Um, what would be the future state? So again, we, we have the opportunity to replace some of our stainless steel with 2,000 liter subs. As you're looking at a two gram per liter cell culture, the numbers are, are very difficult at that range. Some of the more recent monoclonals in the five to 10 reproducibly uh, gram per liter range, really single use is the way to go. Uh, at this two gram per liter, you're right at the cusp of, uh, it's, I'm not really sure if it pans out to go with a smaller size, um, but perhaps you could go ahead and build two subs and combine them to go downstream. So there are ways around it to, to make the economies work. Um, also, when I start looking upstream of the bioreactors at the inoculum and the seed, you know, really there, you shouldn't be looking anymore at 140, 200, 1,000 liters stainless steel tanks. Those are ideally suited for single use, and I think you know that's where we want to move. Um, so if we go downstream, the idea of replacing some of the buffer hole tanks with sums and disposable bags, moving them closer to the chromatography columns, be, just makes sense, and it becomes uh, easier to maintain your inventories, easier to clean, sterilize, things like that. Um, 
there is the the problem with some of our facilities are already built, and this facility was built with um, product hold vessels sized appropriately. Some of the bags don't give you the same opportunities. It is something that you can uh, modify as you need to, and we have looked into doing this where some steps go right into bags, other steps we still have to look into the stainless steel tanks just because of the, the size of the uh, volumes. Um, now if I go up to a 5 liter uh, cell culture, really at this point 5,000 liters uh, becomes a little bit too large for most of our, our common um, MABs at this point. And if you do the math, 2,000 liters at 5 grams per liter is equivalent to 5,000 liter at, at 2 grams per liter, so that's about where we are now. Um, you can really move into a fully disposable system minus the chromatography columns, um, replacing um, because of the, uh, the availability, you can really replace all your small volume tanks with, with sums. Um, you still have the same sort of problems with some of your product tanks, but if you go ahead and start moving towards concentrates, Really now you can start looking at using buffer hold bags for everything. You can move away from the, the fixed connectors and move into uh, single use connectors from your bags to your chromatography columns. You don't have to worry about your stainless steel lines that go into transfer panels and all that other stuff because you're bringing the concentrates to the area of interest. Um, same thing with low pH holds. I think you can even implement new old technologies, if you will, like statics mixers to, to make that uh, easier as well. So uh, trying to summarize and keep us in a reasonable time frame, uh, there are many single-use technologies and manufacturers out there. Um, Sartorius is but one of them. Um, products are available complete gamut from micro scale all the way to manufacturing scale. There are some size limits, as I mentioned, when you start getting to 15, 25,000 liters. Uh, but even there, there are opportunities for hybrid approaches. Um, new facilities, you really should think about designing all your smaller facilities to use disposable processes, especially in the upstream. And as I mentioned, the connectors and the bags in the downstream make a lot of sense. Um, eliminate contamination, especially in aging facilities, by removing some of the need for all the stainless steel tubing, all the dead legs, um, you know, old valves that may leak, uh, even the need for steam and the, the condensate that comes off of steam has issues. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and we'll, we'll start answering some questions. Thank you so much, Ron. Now we will begin the question and answer segment of the webinar. Once again, I would like to remind the audience that you can still send your questions via the questions tab on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, our first question is, in my experience, I found that companies considering fully single-use options are not capturing the inventory management and storage costs in their COGS models. The costs for these single-use items are not just the bags and the hardware to support them. There are tubing sets, clamps, gaskets, impellers, connectors, sanitary couplings, probe assemblies, tubing welders, and other custom options. The implementation of inventory and warehousing costs may not have a large impact on costs. Please justify. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to take that question, Ursula. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, models, what, what I can say is uh, obviously from my time at Biofarm Services, I worked uh, on developing and implementing the Biosolve uh, process modeling tool. And since coming back to Sartorius four years ago, I've implemented uh, a process modeling uh, team working with this Biosolve tool. So. What we aim to do is obviously we, we aim to um, these these models are, are totally uh, interchangeable. So you can have a totally stainless steel model, you can have a totally single use or a hybrid model, and uh, we certainly do aim to involve not only the single use bags but also tubing sets, filters, connectors, gaskets. Uh, custom options can of course be designed in, and that's 
t typically something that our process modeling consultants will do then together with the client. Uh, you know, if, if a specific design has been developed for them, then of course we would implement that into the models. Where uh, the, the person who's put the question does have a point is that at the moment, I would say inventory costs of actually storing the bags within the facility are, are it's something that can be added upon request, but it's probably not in what I would call the standard biosolve model package. Uh, I don't think, uh, however, that inventory costs are enormous, but it's certainly something that we could look at. Um, the I think there was another question also with regard, um, but I would say the aim of working with the biosolve models is certainly that they are as industry neutral, as, as vendor neutral as possible. So I, I saw that there was a question from someone saying, yes, you shouldn't work with vendor models, you know, obviously saying, suggesting that these may not be uh, totally neutral in their approach, and I understand that point. And obviously the aim, again, of working with Biosolve, uh, which many of the end users are also working with, is that, is that you can calibrate the costs together with the end user so that the costs they have, because all the costs are visible in the Biosolve model, so you know uh, you, you you can really calibrate it to the specific process that you're analysing. So you can actually, obviously, what you, what you get out is only as good as you put in, uh, but you can actually get to a pretty fine level of analysis uh, if, if you so wish uh, with with those models for having spent uh, considerable time on on that point. So, but yeah, I would say there is a good point on inventory and warehousing. That's something that may not be. Uh, totally captured on a on a regular basis, but as I said, it can be added in on on request. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, the first question from the audience is, how is cleaning accomplished? Please describe further steamed valves and alternative valves. So you're very lucky. I actually have our uh, senior product manager of Connection Technologies who's just walked into the room, so that was very fortunate timing. So Nicola Tevanan can answer this question uh, for us. Okay. Hello. Um, so basically, uh, the steam uh, through connector, uh, you, you need to have, uh, to have uh, a steam uh, line to, in the facility to connect through the, the part. Okay. So. And uh, you can really, you can uh, Google it, you can uh, type uh, steam through connector and you have a YouTube video from uh, CPC which is providing the, the connector and it's a two minutes video that you can see exactly the, the principle of working. So it's a three ways. You have uh, one connection to a stainless steel tank, one to a tube line and at the end you can have a bag or filter whatever and you have another uh, connection, tri-clamp to a steam line. So first, you, you uh, basically the bag and the tubing are isolated, they are closed, and uh, the product is gamma sterilized. You connect the steam line through a tri-clamp, and then you do a steam sterilization from the steam to the stainless steel tank. When this is done, you, uh, you have to remove a, a cap, protective cap, and then you uh, shut off the steam line and you uh, allow the transfer from the, the tube line through the stainless steel. Okay, and there are two versions of the STC connector, STC1 and 2. Uh, the STC1 is a uh, one-way connector. When you, have, uh, when you are connected the steam line, when you disconnect it and you connect the tube to the stainless steel tank, you cannot go back. The, the STC2, you can go back and have another uh, steam um, step if you want to. Thank you so much. Thank the you, next Nicola. question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The next question is for Welcome. Ron. How do facilities deal with the added storage and disposable requirements? Um, <clears throat> so, okay, so I didn't see that question. So, the um, the facilities it becomes uh, difficult when you're looking at the size of your warehouse because most most people don't build new warehouses to, to uh, accommodate higher volumes of plastics. So it becomes more of uh, an issue with how, how, much, <clears throat> how much supply can you store, how much confidence do you hear in your vent, have in your vendors. And, and one way to, that <clears throat> many people look into this is they, they do work with their vendors to, to get supply agreements so that depending on the frequency of, of need, they can get 
you know, say five lots or ten lots worth of material every, you know, again, depending on their cadence, every couple weeks, or maybe 20 lots every month. Uh, again, it, it's a trade-off, uh, especially for some of the bigger volume ones, like your bioreactor bags and, and um, even your buffer hold and media hold bags, things that take up a lot of space. The ideal situation is to work with the vendor to develop that relationship and the quality agreement as a well, supply agreement, sorry, <clears throat> to, uh, you know, kind of almost using lean manufacturing principles, but to, to get more just-in-time delivery uh, with the, the, odd, the added benefit of some sort of uh, buffer. Thank you, Ron. The next question is, there are also steam to connectors available. What are the pros and cons between steam through and steam to? That's another question for Nicola. <laughs> yes. So uh, if you look at what's available on the market, there are only two options. You have a steam to and steam through. So it's two types of connectors which are available to connect uh, stainless steel to single use. Uh, the steam through uh, has uh, three lines, one to connect to the stainless steel tank, one to the single use assembly, and one to the steam line. The steam two is only two, two ways, one to the stainless steel tank, one through the single use. So I would say the differences is mainly depending on the uh, customer uh, utilities. If he is using uh, a steam line in this facility, then you have this another option. And if not, in that case, if it's fully single use, maybe the customer uh, does not have any steam uh, uh, facility in place or utilities. In that case, this is not an option, and then you will go for the steam too. At the end, there, there is not too many options. And uh, pros and cons, uh, at the end, the price of the connector, if you look at the price, it's in the, in the similar range. Uh, the material of construction is not the same. Um, so depending on the, if it's a high pH or not, you might choose one material of construction. You have uh, two material of construction for uh, STC. You have polycarbonate and polysulfone. And for the Steam 2, I think it's polycarbonate. If, or maybe you have to check for the Steam 2. I'm not 100% I'm not sure. That could be one way. So depending on the, on the setup of the customer, either you have a steam line or not, then you will select one or the other. But uh, I would say on the markets, my, my, my best guess is I would say customers are using steam uh, through connector around 60-70% of the time and steam to 20-30%. But that's the current situation, of course. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next question Thank is you. how would you Welcome. sell... Hello. How would you scale up to SS if your pilot is disposable? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a fairly straightforward question, and I do appreciate it. Um, I would kind of take a step back and, and ask the, the person who asked that, you know, how do you scale up from glass bioreactors now to stainless steel tanks? Uh, it's just a matter of doing your either your power over volume or your um, KLA measurements or both to, to – you know, adequately design or understand the, the dynamics of your bioreactor, and then you scale up accordingly. I don't view the, the issue of scaling up from disposables to stainless steel as being any differently than scaling up from glass to stainless steel, which is the industry norm for decades. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you so much, Ron. Our next question is, do you see any issues with doing pilot plant work when correlating that data to the larger stainless steel systems? Yeah, and I would refer to my last answer on that one. I think it's very straightforward and very, again, it's a good question because you have to make sure you dot the I's and cross the T's. But the work you do at the pilot plant, I'm assuming this is a disposable pilot plant is what we're talking about. Um, it's completely relevant as long as you understand the fluid dynamics of your of your systems, be it bioreactors or columns or, you know, even your mixers, your single-use mixers versus perhaps you have, you know, big stainless steel tanks you're getting to. Um, so your mixing times may change, things like that. But all that is the, is, to me, is the exact same as if you were scaling up from your development laboratory to the pilot plant or a stainless steel pilot plant to a stainless steel um, bioreactor. Most um, you know, most configurations in pilot plants aren't the same as the configurations in the uh, the, the large-scale facility anyways. Often they're at different sites even. So I think these scale-ups 
are, are great questions, and really the, the, the biggest answer I would give is don't be afraid. Just do the same things you would do for your lab. You know, use math, use you know, engineering principles to scale. Thank you, Ron. The next question is, how you propose E and L for complete single-use component, components, process, and facilities? Yeah, this is again. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll oh, sorry, you go ahead, uh, Ron. Yep. <laughs> All right, let me let me give the first, and then I'll then I'll turn it over to the the expert in this. I would propose any time you're looking at doing extractables and leachables, you start off with a risk assessment, and you you handle that backwards from the drug product or through the drug through the drug substance, you know, and you do your studies, um, the difference between extractables and leachable studies, you, you do that accordingly based on risk. Uh, I think it's very simple, and you know there are a lot of papers and presentations out there to define that. So, so that would be my, my quick answer, is use a risk-based approach. Uh, I'll turn it over to Miriam now. now I, I don't really have much to add, Ron. I, I mean, I would think I would simply say, I mean, we, we um, today, like, m something of the industry standard has become the BPOG uh, guidelines here, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously we're all working today towards developing industry standards, and, uh, as single use comes to some level of maturity. And, and so there are guidelines there with regards to extractable packages, so to speak, and then obviously, as you said, the need to do the full process risk assessment, certainly uh, with regards to requirements for further leachable testing. So, and that is well outlined. I can direct you in, in, in that direction. Of course, there are many guidelines out there, um, you know, but the BPSA and BPOG have worked well together on this topic, and I think there has been some level of industry consensus around the guidelines that are given, that are given there. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Ron. The next question is from Miriam again. How do you determine what makes economic sense in terms of mix of disposable and stainless steel components for a given process? Yeah, I think I think to some extent we have touched on this previously, but uh, of course the the scale and tighter and type of process uh, when when we're implementing that into the models, we'll start to see. Typically, you can run multiple scenarios uh, with the models. You can run up to ten different scenarios in parallel and really try to figure out what what mix of stainless and disposables is going to give you, as I said, the highest throughput and lowest cost. I mean, there may be other factors that are of concern to end users as well, um, but really it's on a case-by-case -case basis, and, and that will, you know, the models help you uh, sort of figure that out before you implement as to what your best options uh, could be. So, and, and the models are totally scalable, so you can also, you know, look at what this could look like at scale. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. When integrating disposables into existing facilities, this means that less water for cleaning and steaming will be required. Does this not mean that the utilities in the facility become oversized, leading to a rather inefficient facility? Hmm. I think that's a good question. There is, yeah. And, and yeah. really the, the, yeah. the question you know, is, is how much how much capital do you have tied up into your water systems versus how much benefit can you get freeing up your people to do other things as opposed to spending a shift or two CIPing and SIPing. Um, so so it, it's, yeah. you know, it's one of those questions that you have to ask yourself and you have to do from your own uh, personal, you know, experience or situation because Having an oversized water system is, is, is definitely not ideal, um, but I think there, there are worse things to have than, than a system that can you know, handle way more than you need it to. Thank you. Agreed. Great. The next question is, is it not complicated wheeling disposable containers around a facility that was designed based on stainless steel piping for transfer of fluids? Can there be issues linked to this? Yeah, that's I think that. there can yeah. be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, of, of course, that's, that's one of the considerations. Some of these facilities are jam-packed, 
And in a facility like that, wheeling, a, you know, a 1,000 liters of buffer around is going to be a problem. Um, but, you know, I would say most people wheel their chromatography columns around, which are equally as big and often weigh much more. So I think it, it's all manageable, and it's all based on what you want. The other option is, you know, to to use tubes more, as opposed to trying to wheel around all the the, the big buffers, bags and stuff, is mm -hmm. to go ahead and, yeah. and use disposable tubing to get you from point A to point B. Yeah, I agree with that, Ron. As you say, we try and keep those as stationary as possible, but then it is a question of managing the tubing. And um, certainly, we have seen issues with wheeling Certainly, there's larger containers around the facility in terms of corridor size, you know, uh, door height, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for sure. Those are all things that need to be taken into account. Yeah. Great. Uh, we still have time for two more questions. The next one is, what can be done in the industry to reduce long lead times on certain single-use components and secure the supply chain? I think I'm going to turn that one over to Miriam. <laughs> well, I think one thing that we've implemented at Sartorius uh, is what I call um, well, we're working towards implementing single-use platforms, and the aim here is to offer, uh, as far as possible, standardized um, uh, assemblies, standardized components for, I mean, it's easier, more straightforward to do for a MAP process, for example, and, and on that basis then of design, we will make sure that in terms of the supply chain that we have all these all the contracts in place with our suppliers we have in-depth discussions with the suppliers and make sure that every aspect of that of that end-to-end -end single use map process in that standardized format that we can you know we can really guarantee uh, that that security of supply and in terms of the you know the where the where, where those systems are manufactured and so on and so forth making sure we have multiple facilities in which those systems can be manufactured. I'd say the difficulty comes the more customization a client chooses to implement into a given process, you know, that with the higher customization, if you have a unique component, you always run the risk that it's going to be very difficult to get a, a long-term supply agreement in place with the given supplier of that component. So all we can uh, try to really stress with our and with our clients is that the more that they're, they're able to work with the standardized single-use platforms, which are, you know, scalable platforms uh, that we can offer to them, the more we can guarantee uh, a robust supply chain. The more they go for heavy customization of single-use with unique components, of course, the more difficult that becomes. That's what I would say. And, of course, you know, again, the same for lead times, the more that the clients are working with those standardized platforms, the, the, the more straightforward it is to guarantee a certain, uh, a given lead time. And I mean, you know, that's the same in, in, in any industry, I would say. Thank you, Miriam. Our final question for today is, many single-use suppliers propose off-the-shelf extractables packages today. So are the testing requirements for single-use as one route as was suggested during the webinar? I think that comes back to the BPOG guidelines we were suggesting. I was talking about earlier, where yes, um, uh, you know, there are there are these packages now available for extractables and making the distinction between extractables and leachables from from the certainly the, the five major suppliers, and and I think nearly all of them now are aligning with the BPOG guidelines, which is of course then making it more straightforward for the end users. Uh, of course, on leachables, again, it's very much the approach that Ron talked about earlier where you need to do that full process risk assessment with the product. You're not going to get away from that, and you're going to need to do further specific testing uh, for leachables. But um, I think as the industry matures, as people have a better understanding of the requirements, and as we're moving towards standardization, then, then the issues that we saw in the earlier days with the extractables and leachables are, are, are becoming less because people are, are more aware, better informed, and that they have clearer guidelines to follow. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, again, thank you for your answers, and unfortunately, that is all the time we have left. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters, Miriam Monge and Ron Bates, for sharing their knowledge with us. So, Miriam and Ron, if you have any closing remarks, you can add them now. OK, 
Okay, thank you again. So audience can view this webinar on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.